Hello and happy Valentine's Day, students, faculty, and staff. Welcome to uh, a very important and near and dear to me uh, show today called Representation Matters, because it does. And we're gonna have a panel discussion about the importance of Black queer representation in media. This program is sponsored today by the Mark David LGBTQ Center at CCP and big ups to their coordinator, Vinnie Scarfo, for getting this all set and ready for us to enjoy today. Me, myself, I'm Kendall Stevens, a CCP alum and civil rights and LGBTQ leader and advocate. And I'm just so happy to be here. Go Lions and go Rory. So, Today, we're gonna to welcome two dynamic individuals, uh, Quentin and Ebony. It is my esteemed pleasure to welcome two Philly entertainers that are dominating the game and constantly raising the bar with their artistry and fierceness. So first off, we're going to talk about Quentin J. Alexander, the one and only <laughs> Philadelphia-based theater artist and fight choreographer, wow. Mm -hmm. They have trained at the Philly Improv Theater, taking improv and acting classes, and the Rose Academy of Arms, learning stage combat from fight master Ian Rose, and apprenticed at Latrin Theater Company. He has acted in a number of plays, television, and films, including Midsummer Night's Dream in 2021, The White Feather Project, and One More River to Cross in 2016. Quentin is also the curtain casting director for the Humming Bards mm -hmm. Theater Troupe. He has directed shows like Fear Itself and Fight Call, and co-produced shows such as the hashtag Nightlife, and that is night, K-N-I-G-H-T, Nightlife <laughs> Renaissance yep. Fair. The Artist Temple, Two Person Circus, and hey, we're cool. <laughs> uh, next up, we have again the one and the only Icon Ebony Fairs. Uh, they are a Philadelphia based performance artist that has one mission to change people's perception of artistic expression, one subculture at a time. Icon has a background in theater, dance, and spoken word performance. Icon has been community organizing, curating events all throughout Philadelphia since 2012. Woo, 10 years doing the work. Icon also <laughs> specializes in burlesque, performance arts, and drag. And I've seen the shows, y'all must go. You must go, you have not seen them in action. It is mesmerizing. Their content includes body positivity, political, social issues, gender equality, et cetera. I can go on and on and on just like I could with Quentin. Uh, they are also a curator for festivals like Freak and Queer, and that is Freak with a P-H, you know, like fat, not F-A-T, it's P -H -A -T. <laughs> yep. um, Hot Bits Film Festival and more things always centering QT, P-O-C, QT, Pac, as we all know it, people with an alternative point of view. Wow. <laughs> like I said, we have some powerhouses in the virtual house tonight. <laughs> so at this point, I'm going to allow some of these guests to introduce themselves, maybe give like your name, Zodiac signs, some favorite junk food, just lay, us, lay it on us. So let's start with Quentin, please. Uh, yeah, uh, Quentin J. Alexander. Um, I'm a Capricorn. I even wore my, my Capricorn medallion today. Um, let's see what, what else, what else? Um, I, I use, uh, he, him, and also they, them pronouns. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Your favorite junk food. Don't forget oh, that. Fa favorite junk food, favorite junk food. Um, Oh, I don't know. I, I, I like so many different things. I, I, I like, you know, chocolate chip cookies and I like Cheetos <laughs> and, um, a whole bunch of other things. Um, but Maybe, maybe maybe cookies, maybe cookies are, okay, are, are so, like number so, one. So you're some good old fashioned cookie monster. Oh, yeah. it's all good. I won't tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking good there. Let's get uh, Ebony Fierce. Hello. How you doing, boo? I'm doing uh, good, boo. So, you know, your full name, Zodiac Sign. Yeah. And what do you eat when no one's looking? All right. <laughs> uh, so um, I caught Ebony Fierce. Um, 
my pronouns is she or they. And um, I'm a Virgo. Don't judge me. Um, <laughs> as you know, when people say I'm Virgo, they're like, ooh. <laughs> um, my favorite junk food, I don't know. I'm pretty, um, I have a taste buds of a 40-year-old woman, um, whatever that means. I like garden salsa sun chips. Ooh, that's a that's good that's choice. It. I like I like that. That's a good choice. Yeah, that's <laughs> garden salsa sun chips or um I love seaweed I like seaweed snacks. Seaweed mm-hmm. like the seaweed chips, I love them. The wasabi kind, everything. I'm not sold on the seaweed yet, but I haven't tried it and I'm getting older, so I might try some. Just Maybe you can help me out here. Email me, let me know what you're eating. I'll eat the same thing and if I like it, I'll uh I'll give you a big hug when I see you. If I don't, I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> again, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. Um, obviously, um, again, killing the game in your fields. Um, I just feel like I am surrounded by greatness. And we're going to jump right into these questions because I know we're going to get some marvelous answers. And um, remember, representation matters. So our first question is, what is your overall impression of the current level of representation of Black queer people in mass media? Are any identities over or underrepresented? Start with you. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Ebony. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I was just um, talking to someone about um, how like streaming platforms like HBO Max have basically the most queer content out of all streaming platforms right now. And it's not just representative of just one sort of queer person. It's it's super dynamic. There's like representation of like younger and older and across the board with like different gender identities, different experiences, like shows mm-hmm. like um, Generation that and, and euphoria and um sort of <laughs> like i i feel like with streaming platforms like hbo max and also with um mainstream music like you have little nuts x and kim petras like you know mm-hmm. Dominic, mm-hmm. Uh, the um the music pop charts and then you have like shows like pose that you know had like a magnifying glass into the ballroom scene, but not only just the ballroom scene, but just um, a queer culture beyond that. So I feel like, you know, although it could always be better, we're very dynamic people. Um, it has gotten a lot better over the mm-hmm. past few years. Um, of course, there's still work to do, but I feel like it's it's really, really, really taking a positive um, direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you gave some excellent examples. Uh, many examples that I constantly get excited about mm-hmm. um, because I'm finally see a little bit of me in media, um, which is amazing. And we're not always kind of following the script of, you know, someone trans being a prostitute, you know, or <laughs> tricking somebody or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's good to see more of a well-rounded experience. Good for you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for putting all that stuff out. Now, Quentin, what about yourself? What do you uh, believe? Yeah, so it's it's really interesting to to Icon's point there because because I wrote down some notes too, and I I wrote down stuff like Euphoria and sort of and and Generation, and I just now realized that all of those things are all, are on HBO Max. Um, yeah, and I I think like one thing that I that I could add uh, to what's already been said is I I feel like a lot of the the media that I've been consuming, at least lately, um, has been very like youth oriented, like like the younger set, like the younger Gen Zs and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, with with a couple of exceptions, um, you know, with like Pose that had like you know like a wide variety of like ages as well as genders and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like I I think um, you know in recent time, I I think there's been like a lot of uh, like representation uh, for for the youth, um, which is good. Um, but yeah, like it would also be nice to see some like thirty pluses um, cent- centered uh, queer media as well. 
And I appreciate that. We all know 30 plus is like 50 plus in queer years. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure we're all represented uh, equally. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Big ups to Pose and my girlfriend, Angelica Ross. Love you, boo. Yeah. Call me. So with that being said, actually, uh, Quentin, I want you to definitely start off with this. So, so many stories are centered around a central message um, or more of the story, if you will. Mm -hmm. What values and ideologies do you see represented in Black media and queer media? Um, do they differ or conflict? Um, and where do they align? So there's a lot in that. <laughs> Hopefully you can unpack that for us. Yeah, I, I think that um, in like a lot of like queer media and also like a lot of Black media, um, there there is an importance that is like shown around like things like chosen family narratives, um, you know, the, the connections that we form, um, you know, with each other um, in spite of a world um, that seeks to sever those types of connections, um, things that are outside of, uh, you know, just the, you know, standard like white nuclear family model. Um, and, and like, I, th I think in like a lot of shows, um, you know, and, and movies that we're seeing, um, you know, taking care of like one's community, um, is, is something that I, I take away from like a lot of media that I, that I've seen, um, you know, in recent time. That's wonderful. I mean, I have to agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about just, uh, yourself, uh, Ebony Icon? Um, so uh, I definitely agree with Quentin. Um, a lot of it has to do with like, um, you know, chosen families, um, especially with queer people, because, you know, a lot of queer people have to, um, you know, choose their families because, you know, they've been ostracized from their own. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, a lot of like, um, themes around Black queer media is um, comes with trauma. Yeah. Other times, in in some sort of way, it's just any any sort of trauma. So, um, I so far mostly see things centered around like, um, it does get better, <laughs> you know. Um, your 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 chosen family will you know take care of you. You will get through this. You will become um, you know a star in some sort of way if you just work hard and just, you know, go through the, the ups and downs in your lives, uh, in your in your life. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mostly see. Recently, um, I've been seeing like, you know, a mixture of different um, ideologies when it comes to like queer culture. But yeah, most of them is centered around trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that uh, statement. And I think very much, you know, we see a lot of, uh, I think, actors suffering from double jeopardy, right? When you have like a marginalized experience more than just one, you know, that can all get in the way of you even breaking into the industry, uh, no less uh, being authentically represented. Um, again, it's not always doom and gloom um, in the queer community. And I'm glad that we're seeing more uh, stories that just kind of uh, show the fullness of us, you know, the beauty of us. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. We have fun and we cut a rug and we like to live life too. And that should also be sure. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, speaking of which, um, uh, Fierce, uh, what differences do you notice between white queer and BIPOC queer representation in media? And why do you think these uh, differences exist? With white queer media, um, it's, um, again, trauma. Um, in white queer media, you don't see as much trauma. You see a lot of, um, a lot of the characters and a lot of sh like white queer um, shows. Like Queer as Folk, for example. Um, like these people already have money, they have jobs, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they can afford to go out every night and they go through, you know, ups and downs with dating and um, their sex lives and their personal lives. 
But like, you know, they have money. They they're they're pretty well off. They mm-hmm. live in a supportive neighborhood with supportive family members and whatnot. Uh, with the exception of maybe one character. And when you I mean, we had representation sort of like that from Noah's Ark, um, but uh, that's about it. Um, And I don't know, it's definitely, of course, we all know privilege has a lot to do with that because when you think about BIPOC experiences, queer experiences, it's not always, um, you know, the most positive. Mm -hmm. I would say. And it's not fully representative of how complex we are as as people. Because in my experience, um, I don't see myself represented in that sort of way. Mm Because, you know, I've had ups and downs. I've had, um, you know, a pretty bad family experience. But then again, I don't really see that represented in, you know, TV shows and whatnot. Um, I have friends who don't necessarily have really traumatic experiences growing up. They've had supportive families and they end up, you know, having rich, not like rich as far as money, but pretty rich lives in general. I don't really see that represented all the time. Um, And of course, again, it has a lot to do with privilege. Um why people have always been seen as, you know, more well-off than Black people. And of course, you know, that sort of thing shifts when you introduce queer into it. So Mm -hmm. those are my thoughts. And your thoughts align with my thoughts. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Like, (laughs) yeah, like you were not kidding about like, like things like queer as folk and also like, um, like the L word and and stuff like that, where it was sort of that like, like that early 2000s, like post-discrimination type of media that, that they were putting out around that time, where it was like, everything's fine you know, people are rich, maybe this person struggles a little bit, but, you know, for the most part, things are good. Um, yeah, I, w- I would say that, that that rings pretty true even to, like, this day. Um, and I think one thing that I see in a lot of, uh, a lot of like, like BIPOC uh, queer representation um, is that there's always this, uh, like, eventually you're going to have the episode where the, the, the family finds out or you have to deal with the family member not accepting, uh, you know, of, of this person's, uh, you know, queerness and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I, I feel like in like a lot of like a lot of white queer media, a lot of them skip that part and then they just go into having the wacky adventures. So that's how I feel about it. <laughs> I've I've noticed the same phenomenon and could not explain it, um, but this is why we're talking about these differences because um, it it can make it seem like there's a double standard when it comes to um, a queer experience uh, that is BIPOC related and a queer experience that is not, mm-hmm. um, and that's what causes these subdivisions in our community. You know, it reinforces these divisions. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I totally agree. So, uh, speaking of which, speaking of, of of queerness and about all that we spoke about with representation and what that means, there's levels. So, how can queer representation in media drive current and future liberation movements? And should Black queer creators have an obligation to do so, Quentin? Um, so, like, I don't want to say that like every single like. Black queer artist like has an obligation because like I don't think that every single black queer person has that experience or insight to tell every type of story. Um, you know, you should definitely write what you know. Um, I think that people should at least be aware of of different experiences and different stories. Um, and I believe that that we can have like a mix of um, you know of of different types of show and different types of genre. Um, it doesn't always have to be 
traumatic. Um, you know, it can be comedic. It can be um, it can be like fantasy. It can be you know like people time traveling or traveling through space or whatever. Um, and and those are the types of things that I would like to see um, you know in in the future to like you know to 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 yeah to like have escapism you know the way that you know white people have always had escapism and and these stories where they could see themselves as the the hero or the villain of of these stories you know um so that that's yeah and i i think i think seeing like a wide variety of stories will help you know drive like current and like you know future movements um so that's that's how i feel about that <laughs> Well, you know, we can't normalize queer until we normalize um, our experiences and our representation in media. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll get there. We'll get there. One day you'll see a trans black woman in space kicking butt and taking names. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Fighting aliens and all sorts of stuff. But <laughs> we know one step at a time, we are getting there. Mm -hmm. So what about you, uh, Fierce? How do you feel about this question? No, I, no, I, I was just in my head, I was saying that like, you know, sci-fi is inherently queer. Um, yes. A lot, and a, lot, um, a lot of characters from the past have been, like, queer. We, we are in, it's like an underlining um, thing. But I feel like, you know, more explicit representation in that world would be great because a lot of, a lot of Black queer people are nerds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Video game nerds, anime nerds, there's a lot, a lot, I know a lot of black queer people are nerds. So it will be great to have that sort of, um, you know, representation. Uh, as far as like, you know, whether or not should, you know, it should drive, queer representation should drive current and future liberation movements. Um, I, like Quentin said, um, you know, not everything has to be rooted in uh, black queer people, you know, being a liberator, um, a protester, an activist, because not all black people are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not everyone's responsibility to have that. And people don't have that same experiences, although people should be in the movement. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you are black and queer, you should be in the movement. You know, you should be, you should agree that you know, liberation and matters and we should be out there fighting. But also, um, liberation movements doesn't necessarily have to come from entertainment. Yeah. Um, all the time. I should say all the time. Like, although, like, you know, in my wor world, um, drag is a sort of way activism because it's, you know, drag queens have always been you know, not just in the clubs, but also in the marches, you know, you dress all wild and you're just like, fuck, you know, fuck the normalcy. I'm sorry, can I curse? <laughs> I was wondering Why about, I was wondering about that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you're muted, Kendall. Kendall, you're muted. I said, I said, that's passion. So, you know, let that flow, you know, keep it to a minimum, but let it flow. <laughs> <laughs> but no, all in all, um, yeah, like, like I said before, like every, we're all dynamics and our experiences are dynamics. And, um, do I think it should necessarily fuel, um, liberation movements? Yes. But also, you know, that's not all we represent. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, speaking of that. You know, it's time to dig a little deep, you know, um, we get to dig deep now. You know, one thing I will say about our community is a lot of things, idiosyncratic schisms that happen that only we kind of talk about, but we kind of don't talk about it and it ends up on the cutting room floor of our cultural experience. Uh, so speaking of that, we want to kind of get into our next question. I want you to dig deep now. How do you feel about the media portrayal of serious topics impacting our community um, in Black queer media, like intimate partner violence, things that we don't often discuss and talk about, but it's very prevalent in the queer experience, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, 
again, we're seeing that disproportionately uh, presented in uh, Black queer um, uh, communities and uh, intra community transphobia, you know, that we see a lot of. Mm -hmm. Where, like you said, to your point, you see um, a, a lot of, um, you know, queer trans, uh, uh, you know, and, um, you know, drag queens, you know, uh, often leading the movements, but don't really get the respect that they deserve, you know, so um, it's, a, it's a sad thing. But do you feel differently, like the media telling these QT Pac stories is created to cater to a white or a cishet audience? How do you feel about so that? So one thing that comes to mind is trauma porn. Um, and what trauma porn is, is um, basically people that don't have like the same experiences as the people, as the characters that they're watching, um, they, they kind of, they're entertained by um, the amount of trauma that is portrayed in that, um, at, uh, in that media. Um, I am okay with, you know, um, honest and gritty and um, serious topics, but if it's not written by a person that's had those experiences, I don't really, I don't, I don't, I don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see a white cis hat person um, writing or directing a movie or a show about a non-binary person um, or a black person trans woman um getting kicked out of their high school i don't want to or i don't want to see a white cis head man um talking about a black queer woman um like going through drug abuse I, it just doesn't sit right with me um and i think when they're if there's white people writing these things i feel like it's more so to appeal to a white crowd mm -hmm. um and Honestly, it's not really all that accurate all the time. So when you when you see the shit on TV, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's um, <laughs> you know, there's the truth to this, but who is it for? Yeah, yeah. And also, why is like these traumatic experiences coming across a little campy? Because that's what I feel like. Like for example. The movie Precious, mm, mm -hmm. um, to me, is trauma porn. And it's to the point where Precious comes across very campy in its delivery um, and speaking about Black trauma. So I do feel differently. I've always felt differently about it. Like, I don't want to see it if, you know, we're not writing about our own experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from. Again, I share um, exactly some of the sentiments that you have. Um, it definitely hits home, for mm -hmm. sure. Quentin, what about yourself? Yeah, um, so I, I I felt that we were eventually going to get to the to the topic of of trauma porn, and I think the first time I ever heard that term used was around the time when uh orange is the new black was was out that was around when i first heard that term um and i think it started happening well i mean it it, it was always a part of that show um but i think it became very aware i became very aware of it and, very, and it became very prevalent um somewhere towards like the middle of of that series where all of the worst things that were happening to those characters were happening to the either uh, black or, or, or Latina characters, um, you know, the, the white characters. I mean, you know, everybody like would have like things that were going on with them, but I feel like, like the black and Latina characters were catching like the worst of it. Um, and I, and I understand, you know, we're writing a show that takes place in a women's prison, um, and 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 bad things do happen in those places. Um, abolish prisons, by the way. Um, and yeah, but like you're 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 using all of your like you know bipod characters um, to to illustrate the these points, and that's something that doesn't sit right with me. Um, and 
I don't know. Like, yeah, it 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 do, it does like rub kind of raw when 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 it's when it's white cis had people um, writing these things and these scenarios to torture these characters essentially. Um, and and I mean it even happens in 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 more like black led things like um like like Lovecraft Country for for instance like you know I I was really excited for those first couple of episodes and then somewhere along the way it was like oh but this is this is this is this is a an extreme dramatization of 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 real tragedy like we're we're gonna use the sci-fi aspect to 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 ramp it up in a, in a way but it's still trauma at the end of the day um yeah so that that's kind of what i wanted to add there <laughs> well then i have a question for you uh quentin and then uh fierce um how do we handle black queer trauma responsibly in in our media Ooh. that's a very good question I mean, because I believe that we should be the ones telling our own stories. I think mm -hmm. historically has always been um, a very white, cishet um, lens, you know, telling um, the stories that um, we live through day in and day out, you know? So you lose so much of, of that authentic connection mm -hmm. to what the truth is, you know? And, and the truth is, if you have not walked a mile in our stilettos, <laughs> In our in, in our in our shoes and our heels and our flip flops and our whatever, then I wonder how much of the story you can really tell about our experience. But you know, it's about how, how do we handle that trauma just responsibly and, and and with um a sense of ethics while still telling the the full story of our experience, right? Without mm -hmm. you know um watering down our experience because trauma is real, um and and it, it does impact us tremendously. So how can we you know, what's that middle ground? <laughs> and Ferris, you can jump in if you want, if you have some ideas. Uh, I, I think handling with care is very important um, in consideration to the people who um, that view it. Um, you know, all, content warnings is always like, you know, people can argue about content warnings, but I feel like they're important. Um, which some shows have, you know, that sort of deal, but I feel like that's really important. Um, I think that, again, if, if it's authentic and the people who are writing about these experiences have these lived experiences, um, are, are writing it and it's, it comes across with the accuracy that it deserves, I feel like it, it could be dealt with differently. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like if there was a show about, you know, a, a black queer person going through rehab, um, it's important that, you know, every single nuance of that experience, you know, coming from a black queer person is, is important. Otherwise it just comes across, um, like again, campy or just, um, over the top. Sometimes our traumatic experiences can be very layered. Um, so, you know, <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not saying that like these things are going to happen overnight, but I feel like as we start to see more representation, we can kind of get to know the nuances and the dynamics of Black queer, queer people's trauma, just like how there are layers and nuances with, you know, white people's trauma and representation in media over the past almost 100 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Totally agree. Quentin, you want to add on that at all? Or? Um, yeah, and like, I, I'm, I'm thinking about like, like like especially like if a project is not a black led project um you know like the creator is white or whatever um i feel like that like and if they're going to have like they need to have like you know 
Black, Indigenous, POC people in those writers' rooms um, so that, like, if something comes up, um, you know, in, in, in like, representing, like, a, a certain type of trauma, like, the, the, the white creator might not even realize that that's something that is triggering for Black people, but that person needs to to listen, uh, you know, to the to those people in the in the writers' room that are more familiar with those experiences, and maybe you know let them take the reins a little bit on how to like navigate telling that narrative in in a way that you know takes the audience into consideration. Yeah, and it's kind of speaking of that narrative, you got me thinking about something. You got me thinking about. What is that kind of go-to movie, if one even exists, that we can show um, our cishet friends <laughs> um, of the well-roundedness um, of, of our experience, right? I don't think we have that. I could tell somebody, you know, the top three Black movies you have to watch before you die. You know, I'll put Set It Off in there and, you know, New mm. Jack City and, you, you listen, we'll go there now. You know, but I think when it comes to the Black queer experience, I think we're still lacking. So I want to take a little bit of a deep dive into your um, wonderful creative mindsets here. If you were to create a, a, a movie or um, something on Broadway, uh, what would that look like that uh, I think would this kind of tell the totality of our stories in, in a way that could be very marketable, um, that would honor us as queer people, but, but not pander to people or to us? How would that look? Hmm. I'm asking y'all folks because y'all got the creative minds. I mean, I'm <laughs> this is not my um, <laughs> and I hope from, somebody can feel free to like, you know, put this idea into fruition. I have a fantasy of just like, you know, people that represent like, you know, all sorts of gender variant um identities um coming together. Um and you know, and in the trans lens, and um, just have a funny living single style sitcom. Like oh. I would love to see that. It's like um, 20, 30 year old, like you know, people with different backgrounds, experiences, financial, um, you know, backgrounds, and everything else. Just like just talking about, like you know, their just, just having fun, going through their work, you know, going through their sexual experiences, finding themselves, even little funny things like, you know, um, I was in the club and I pissed myself trying to talk <laughs> to this guy. You know, just things like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to see more of because... You know, I love shows like Living Single and Girlfriends because it, it kind of expanded on, you know, the Black experiences is not just, you know, rich or poor, um, you know, privilege, no privilege. It shows the dynamics of everyone. That's what I would love to see. Someone can make <laughs> that happen. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I I really love that idea. I I would I would watch that show. <laughs> I say we need like a black queer soap opera. Okay, like General mm. Hospital. No, <laughs> that's what we need. That's what we need. You know, I would love to see that. You know, like a little bit of grit. So maybe like a nighttime uh, soap <laughs> opera. You know, it's gonna get gritty. You know, like queer after dark. You know, <laughs> queer after dark. Queer after dark. <laughs> queer after dark. You know, if you're queer and you're black, you're breaking all the rules. You're breaking all the rules. <laughs> and that's what makes us so unique. I think that what makes our stories uh, so impassioned and and so newsworthy, right? You know, it's so media ready. You know, because we don't have to make nothing up. These are our experiences. You know. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, I've been through everything, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, but it mm -hmm. has made me the strong person that I am, you know, and that's what queerness is. I think it's really about Black queerness, being strong, you know, not just relying on, on the resilience, that's good too, but that empowerment is just so important, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know, um, being able to battle all these different odds, but being able to see the light at the end of the tunnel and never giving up on that light, you know, I think it's important. You know, even if you get destroyed in the process, and that happens to so many of us, you know, so many of us are living in our truths and trying so hard to just get to that light. So we see um, us in media, that's the light. That's the light, you know, and, and I so love all of my brothers, sisters, and others who are in media, doing us right, representing us fiercely and, and with um with truth and and, and um with fierceness. That's what I appreciate. So I love it all. I love it. My Laverne Cox, even though, you know, she gets hired for everything, you know, like you know, she's the only black trans woman, you know, but it's just I want to see more. <laughs> listen, I want to see more fresh, queer, black faces mm-hmm. out there you know just turning it out i want to see just this that freshness we need that so much so mm-hmm. thank, you for, thank you for sharing that yeah um and i'm gonna uh the last two questions uh starting with this this is something that's uh, really personal i feel like these days these kids get it and i think black queer media helps them get it especially in neighborhoods that are black and brown very baptist sometimes very, you know, hostile to homosexuality and transgenderism and, you know, and queerness altogether. You know, if you were to like design a PSA for all schools everywhere, how would that look? How would that media PSA look that could tell our stories in a way that would honor us and help kind of break down some of these misconceptions and stereotypes and help humanize us as, as queer people, queer black people, okay? How would that look? I know I'm digging into your creative minds because, you know, we have two extraordinary minds. So I want <laughs> to, I got to get inside of that mind and see how it would look. I just keep thinking about the vibe of uh, the beach episode of Pose. Like, I oh. love I love that episode and like I I feel like it needs to be a similar vibe where it is like queer black people it's like having a good time you know and you know just like existing at, at like as their truest self like in in the same yeah like going to the beach having a good time I don't know like some something like that <laughs> What about you, Fierce? <laughs> um, I feel like um, if I just something that can um really push the idea that um something that will humanize us. Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, there's an idea with uh, straight people, especially cis hat people, that um. Their representation, their their view on queerness, um, is taught, especially um, with you know their own families, and you know people around them. Um, I feel like if there was a PSA, it will it would kind of look like, you know, just queer people being human, showing the dynamics of different queer people, and showing that like. You know, we're dynamic, we're complex, just like everybody else is. Mm -hmm. We're human. Yeah. And the only difference is that our experiences is a little altered because um, we're not welcomed and we we still have a long ways to go when it comes to, like, you know, our dealing with our families, dealing with the education system, dealing with, you know, the healthcare system dealing with um, employment and everything else, housing and everything else in between. <laughs> yeah. And I- showing that, hey, we're human, uh-huh. but um, we can't be ourselves and be human because there are these things stopping us, but we're still mm-hmm. human. Yeah. I, I just love that idea. You know, I often think about you know, show some of our our daily struggles as well, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and and also too, Mm -hmm. how we reclaim our power after we've been disempowered all throughout the day, Mm -hmm. you know, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I I have have yet to see these scenes where you're at the welfare office and your name isn't changed yet and someone's ready to, you know, know, embarrass you in front of the whole 
you know, uh, it happened to yeah. me. Listen, they, they, they were calling my dad name over that speaker. Mm. And child, I would not answer. I didn't move a, a, a nudge. And I crept up. Listen, by the way, that that's me. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yours. That's me. <laughs> but there's a way to kind of I think, talk about that in a way that could still be even comedic. Ooh. You know, that could be comedic. Yeah. But, but again, we have to be the ones telling our stories. Mm -hmm. uh, because we know that we're yeah. the ones telling it. If we're the ones telling it, that we know that the intent, more often than not, it's not going to be um, something that is an ill intent, you know. Um, so I just look forward to see what the future lies for queer black media. I think the sky is the limit. I really do. And I think some of us have just, like you, um, Ebony and, and, and Clinton, have just burst through, not glass ceilings, but concrete ceilings. You know, to just, you know, turn it out and show what we can do as black queer people in media. It's amazing. It is amazing that you have done. So... Now, with that being said, the last question of the day is, what is your top three favorite examples of queer representation in media and why? So I'm with you, um, um, Icon. You got the floor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, um, as, of, as of recently, um, I love Sort Of because... There's hmm. never been a show about a um, QPOC non-binary person um, going through awkward shit in life and dealing with their family in a traditional sense and um, having these weird, strange relationships with people. Um, I love that. Like, there's never been a show like that before. So it was it was really refreshing to see. Especially mm -hmm. through a lens of a you know a millennial, which is like late twenties, early thirties. Yeah, I'm like that's the closest my experiences that I can have. Um, <laughs> um, another example of queer representation in the media. Um, I have to show appreciation for like um, people like Lil Nas X that's been. Mm -hmm. Um, really showing that pop music can look like so many different things and pop music can change in so many different ways. And we can have fun and silly and stupid gay references um, in, in that sense. Like, for example, when, um, when he was promoting his album, um, there was like this little clip of him running to the hospital and he said bussy. And I'm like, okay, so yes. <laughs> we have <laughs> we have arrived. <laughs> we have arrived. Uh, <laughs> um another um another example I will have to say is all of the amazing um, black trans actresses mm -hmm. um, and singers and artists that we've seen, that we are seeing like come up, like Michaela J um, from Pose, MJ Rodriguez, mm -hmm. um, you know, Laverne, um, like so many, so many different. So many different like actresses, authors, and um, writers, um, producers, and and beyond that we see people we see behind the scenes and in front of the camera um, being represented more and more and more and more and more every day mm -hmm. is you know something that I'm looking forward to and something that I've been really enjoying seeing so. Ooh, I love you. You got me excited. I'm over here just having church. Okay. <laughs> I, I am enjoying it. Ooh, Black Queer Power. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Now it's on you now. You want to take us home? Yeah. So I I would definitely say that that pose um makes that list. Um, you know, I haven't seen anything like it um before. Um and like a prime time drama that centers like queer and trans folks um and 
like now you're seeing it like you know launch so many careers um you know like talk to talking about mj talking about um angelica ross um and you know those 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 actors actors and actresses um like i'm i'm probably going to be following their careers for for a while you know like you know i i'm always like I've, i follow angelica ross on uh on on instagram and i'm always following up on on her posts and like all of the things that she's doing um yeah like um another show that um and and this is like I, I feel like this is probably one of the bigger hits with me, like during like pandemic time where you're just like stuck inside all the time, but legendary um, to see a show that is, that is centered around ballroom, like in the same way that you would watch like a dances with the stars or, or something like, or, or something like that. Um, and every time I watch legendary, it reminds me of how much I enjoy performance just in general like um to see them come up with all of these different um you know pieces and, and stuff like that and like these different performances and costumes and see um people of like you know like of like every gender every sexuality every, like body types you know celebrated um and oh, I'm, I'm gonna throw a cartoon uh in there um, and I'm gonna say like She-Ra, uh, Princess of Power, the the most recent She-Ra uh, reboot that came out on uh, on Netflix. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, just like a lot of like queer representation in in a setting, you know, that is fantasy, sci-fi, um, fight and evil stuff like that, and it and it's and it's explicit, you know. <laughs> so those are my picks. Can I? Please, please. This is what I have. Everyone needs to watch Hot House. Um, so Hot House is a new reality show. It's um, Hot H A U S. It's a new reality show. It's on Apple TV and um, some somewhere else. But um, Hot House is a reality television. It's new um, competition series. Um, trying to find the newest queer set symbol. So it's based mm. on performance. But what I love about that is that there are so many different body types and so many different levels of queerness um, represented in that show. We have um, we have Fantasia, who is an amazing um, drag entertainer in Florida, um, Black trans woman, who has like this amazing 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 like performance style and body mm. <laughs> and so there's like so many different like representations on that show um cupcake the rapper is in that um it's one of the judges i think so definitely watch that um i feel like that's gonna take things to the next level nice i'm gonna check that out yeah and we're getting messages in the chat saying possibly it's on out tv Mm. Out TV, yeah. Okay, so Out TV it is for those that are interested. I'm definitely going to be checking this out. It is on my playlist to watch tomorrow, so I'm really excited. Thank you for that share. Well, that concludes our show for today, so thank you both for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you, audience, for joining as well. Big, big ups to Quentin J. Alexander and icon Ebony Fairs. Let's go. Thank you for being our guest today. Totally. I'm so excited. Um, join us next month on March 3rd for a panel on queer parenthood, co-sponsored by the CCAMPIS grant through the Women's Outreach and Advocacy Center. Make sure to follow our Instagram, y'all, at CCPLGBTQ. Again, that is on Instagram, at CCP, LGBTQ, Twitter, and Facebook. See, so we got the game on lock. Use the links in our bio to join the LGBTQ student email list. Bye, everyone. I miss you already, but hey, see you next month. Thank you all. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>